forms of de-extinction are going to happen anyway, and it could go in a kind of responsible or maybe irresponsible way. And now's the time before we have seriously de-extincted species back on the scene to put in position the norms, the ethics, the sense of responsibility of how to do it right. So in this decade, you'll see major milestones of the beginnings of extinct species coming back, and then over the coming decades, more and more. There's three ways so far to bring extinct species back. One of them is a fairly classic backbreeding. Uh, the European aurochs is being approached in this way, where you're looking at well, seven different breeds of fairly primitive looking, very hardy, comfortable in the wild cattle in Europe that are being bred specifically to, to get back the traits and then the genetic profile of the European oryx that, that went, went extinct in 1627, the last one died. Very important animal in the, the whole ecology of Europe and indeed all the way over to Asia. Uh, a second technique is cloning. If you do have deep frozen tissue of an animal before it went extinct, uh, you can do what's called interspecies cloning and a, a surrogate mother animal from a closely related species to the extinct animal uh, can serve as a mother to bring back the extinct animal. And then the third technique is, is the radical one, which is just emerging from George Church and others. And this is where you could take what's called ancient DNA from museum specimens and indeed from fossils up to 200,000 years old and basically reconstitute the genome of the extinct animal and then, uh, in effect, hybridize it through what's called allele replacement. In effect, uh, hybridize it with a close-living relative of the animal and transform over a period of stages the close-living relative into the extinct animal. And then uh, they breed, in, uh, probably in captive breeding in zoos for a while until you've got a population big enough to begin restoring to the wild. I think we'll find out as we go through this that some animals are easier than others. Um, I'm told by the people who've had experience with cloning, for example, that mammals, placental animals, are easier than birds. On the other hand, there's now this amazing technique to turn chickens basically into extinct bird factories, <laughs> and uh, maybe that'll make them easier, but you find, that, you find out that kind of thing by doing it. I think there'll be a lot of discussion, and it's a lot of good scientific discussion and, in a sense, cultural discussion about which of the animals that you would focus on trying to bring back first. And part of it is which ones do you really want back? Well, people would just adore to see woolly mammoths again, and there's plenty of habitat for those mammoths if they come back. And they'll start, start recreating what was called the mammoth step back in the day, which uh, for climate reasons actually would be a very good thing. Um, there's iconic animals like the passenger pigeon. The passenger pigeon is, uh, you can go from passenger pigeon egg to next passenger pigeon egg in six months. To go from baby mammoth to baby mammoth is 18 years. <laughs> so, you know, there's a time frame difference. There's whether there's habitat for them. Um, I think it'll vary a lot in the, in the discussion. Um, part of the fun of this is we get to discuss this and think it through in these years while the capability is building. So that, and I'm very happy with that because what I would like to see is by the time we start to get some of these extinct animals back, people should be saying, well, what took so long? <laughs> uh, and that the welcome will, will really be in place. I grew up in Northern Illinois, which was uh, part of the of the range of the passenger pigeon. And uh, I heard about them when I was growing up. Um, my mother said that when these animals died that everybody knew so well, everybody knew passenger pigeons. They were a phenomenon. They, they were like Niagara Falls. And when they were gone, it broke America's heart. Uh, it taught us about extinction. Uh, it's an iconic bird. And the idea that that terrible mistake could be reversed. It could fulfill a kind of a, a moral duty to undo some serious harm um, and let it be a model for undoing other versions of that kind of harm. And that's pretty attractive. Ideally, 
you know, people will look at uh, life history of passenger pigeons in a few decades or centuries, and uh, you know, passenger pigeons will be common. There'll be these large flocks going around. And uh, their history will have been that they've been in North America for six million years, except for one century, the 20th century.